My name's Annette Pugh, and uh, I'm sitting here with Maureen and Lithia Park at the Lower Duck Pond, surrounded by the beautiful trees and the Shakespeare Festival. I uh, came to Ashland for the first time in 1971, and uh, I was on my way to Canada to get my husband out of the draft. And uh, we stopped here in Ashland because my brother was going to uh, Sox, Southern Oregon College at that time. He had come here from Switzerland and he wanted to go to school here so that he could ski every day. And we stopped and uh, we were down on Oak Street at his rental house. It was a dirt road at that time. And um, Lance and I, uh, my husband, had moved from Los Angeles right after the earthquake in the early 70s and uh, we were looking for a new life. So we stopped in Ashland and that morning the sun came out, there was a lace curtain and there was a bird in the tree singing and I thought, wow, this is not Los Angeles, this is where I want to be. So we walked down to the plaza. We had both had a, an extensive retail background working for the May Company as departments, uh, as buyers for 22 department stores. And so we were retail people and we walked onto the plaza and a lot of the shops were boarded up. Um, you could tell it was poor, there were no restaurants, there was a little old grocery store. It was pretty pitiful, it was very quiet. Um, very intriguing. To me it looked like a gold mine in the future and Lance and I discussed it quite a bit about how this town had everything, the makings of a, a beautiful tourist place and we could see shops thriving, restaurants thriving, so on and so forth. So we went back to LA, we quit our jobs with the May Company and Lance and his mother came up while I was still working and closing out the house and uh, they bought an old grocery store on the plaza called Lithia Grocery. And uh, I thought, what the heck am I gonna do with the grocery store? S but we moved up here, uh, moved into my brother's rental with him for a while. And uh, soon we had a few of Lance's fraternity brothers come and stay with us. They were looking for a way out of LA too and they began to work on the uh, grocery store with us. We remodeled, I got creative and displayed popsicles by color, Campbell's soup cans by pyramids, you know. But we realized that the grocery store was running on homebound people that ordered food to be delivered to their house but that the grocery store did not carry those foods themselves, so they had to go to Safeway and get the food to deliver to the people. It was a losing proposition. The whole plaza was a losing proposition. So as we got into it a little bit more, we realized there's no restaurants here. Shakespeare at that time only was open for about a month and a half. They only performed for a month and a half and you had to make all your money in that time. So we decided to make sandwiches and salads to sell to the tourists so they could bring it to the park uh, and have picnics. And that kind of began our restaurant experience. We did all cold lunch foods at that time. Uh, sooner uh, than later, we had another group of people come and talk to us. Um, Oh, excuse me, I'm jumping ahead too far. So we were, we were kind of struggling along with Lithia Grocery, deciding who we were going to be, what we needed to do, when on uh, January 1st, New Year's Day, there was a flood. I believe it was in 1973. And uh, we were sitting in the Log Cabin Tavern, which was now run by um, a motorcycle guy and uh, Caviglio. It was the popular biker bar. It was a lot of fun. 
And we were sitting there late at night on New Year's Eve and we could hear the creek rising and the boulders rolling, tumbling. It sounded like thunder. And we didn't realize at that time, but that indicated that the plaza was going to flood. So we went home, it was, you know, maybe midnight, one o'clock. And um, we got a call from the police at about 2.33 in the morning that the plaza was flooding. You need to get downtown to your business. So we, we packed up, ran downtown uh, from our home with backpacks on with some supplies in there. And we got into the restaurant and sure enough, the water was rising all around us. The basement was beginning to fill up with water. We tied a big rope from the front door out to something on the plaza. And that was the only way people could get across the flood was just rushing water. We had a potbelly stove in, in, in Lithia Grocery and uh, that's how we heated the place. And we went through 27 cords of wood a winter. And so Lance and his fraternity brothers spent a lot of time cutting wood and gathering wood for our business. But because of the heat and the ability to cook, I made big pots of soup and all the people from the plaza got to work together. And when we first moved to town, we were from California. We were Californicating Oregon. People didn't like us. Um, the people in town were old timers, lived here all their life. And a bunch of people from California, mostly hippies were coming not really hippies, but let's say entrepreneurs who look like hippies came to town. There was Brooks Hodap started Nimbus. Um, Matt Fry uh, did Rare Earth. Jack and, and um, Torelli did the Log Cabin Tavern. We were here doing Lithia Grocery. The people did not like us. They, they didn't want to know us. They didn't want to have anything to do with us. But when the flood happened, we, f we found out that all the basements were linked together. So we had shoes from Perrine's department store. Uh, there was a big department store on the corner now where I work at Gateway Real Estate. It's called the, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it, but we'll find out what the name of the department store was. Anyway, their merchandise was flowing back and forth, so we all had to work together and because we fed them, uh, we all worked together for days and days. We got to know one another and it changed the whole dynamics of the newcomers and the old timers on the plaza. We, we became friendly, we said hello, uh, we understood each other's problems. We uh, got together to work to make the plaza better. So that was the beginning of a friendship where there had been a lot of divisiveness and it was really good. So in 73, they pretty much left it to the building owners to take care of things. I, I don't remember, they didn't do the changes that they did in 97 on that flood. You know, they rebuilt the, the waterway and everything, so it's not supposed to flood as easily. Um, the city really didn't do that much that I remember. I think Lance wrote about it in his book about the dam. They worked on um, the dam. Him and a, a, a group of hippies went up there to work with the, the um, I think they had the National Guard up there. I'm not sure. You'd have to review that story, but that was their involvement. They weren't so involved with the actual plaza. They were much more up in the dam area. And the Parks Department, of course, cleaned up a lot of the, the trees that came down. So uh, after the flood, you know, there a lot of FEMA money came in. Every time there's a flood, the stores on the plaza get nicer because they get money from the government. Because of the FEMA money at Lithia Grocery, we were able to put in a full kitchen um, and do more with the food preparation. So we had one group in the morning who did breakfast. We still did lunch. And we had another group of people who did a Mexican restaurant at night. 
So we had three different operations. And at one time, we even had a late coffee uh, pastry time for people coming out of the theater. We tried anything we could to get people in there. And we did very well. We had, at lunchtime, we would have all the doctors in town, all the legal people come in for lunch because it was kind of cool to go to a hippie place and uh, have fabulous organic food, fresh baked bread. Our best selling sandwich was a super deluxe avocado and cheese sandwich, which I patterned after a Big Mac. I figured people were eating a lot of those and they needed a good way to get that food. So it had um, rennetless cheese on it, fresh avocados, sprouts, and um, roasted soybeans on whole wheat mana bread. And we sold a million of those things. They, they were the hot item. So that's how our business progressed. Were they separate businesses all in the same? They were all separate, separate. businesses. Uh, and we had like three boxes of tomatoes in the walk-in. Uh, we always ripened our avocados because we had to stay ahead of that. The avocados, we learned uh, that if we put them up high on a shelf in a black plastic bag with a bunch of bananas, they would think they were in the jungle and they would ripen. So we were able to stay ahead of, because we went through cases of avocados a week. And so we learned how to ripen them and keep them going. So Where did you get your, your pro products? It must have been... There were a couple uh, produce places, one out of Medford. Um, Organic. Well, there wasn't much organic at that time. It was the the word organic really hadn't come around. We used the word natural food, fresh natural food. There were no family farms here in those days. There was no wine in the state of Oregon. We didn't even have a wine or beer license. We didn't want to deal with it because um, the log cabin was right next door to us. People could take their sandwich over there and eat because they didn't serve food. So we never really saw a need to do wine or beer, which saved us a lot of heartache, I think. Um, but there was, the wine industry does not, did not exist. There were no beer makers here in that time. There were no family farms. Organic hadn't even started yet. So uh, I saw a change in that whole thing. Now our valley is full of wineries, beer makers, the best food grown in the world here. It, it's it, it, it was kind of like a preview to what was coming. What did you wear? What did you look like? I had hair as long as mine is now, but it was uh, red and um, wore long skirts, Birkenstocks. At Lithia Grocery, we served food. At the front of the store, we had no co-op. We had no none of the natural products we have now. But I was able to order Tom's toothpaste and um, Dr. Bronner's soap, Dr. Bronner's chips. So I had that in the front like a grocery store and people could come in and get products that they couldn't get anywhere else. And they were natural. And then we served the food and we also had the license to sell Birkenstocks. So we sold sandwiches and Birkenstocks and groceries. It, it was pretty interesting, but it worked very well after we became even more popular. I mean, it, the place was packed. We had a lot of musicians play there. Sunday brunch was packed. People loved coming in there. We served moo tea, uh, which uh, we sold gallons of that every day. What was it? Moo tea was uh, from Chico, um, California. Chico San, it was one of the earliest organic companies. And they had a, a a truck that would ship up to us from Chico. So people have talked about your store from all over. People from Salmon River, oh, yeah. Sawyer's Bar, people from uh, Black Bear out, out down. People at, would come in Tacoma. from the communes. Uh, we had this one guy that was called Earthworm who would come to the place and he always wore a little leather g-strap and uh, he smelled like an earthworm and it was funny. I mean, we had some real characters that came in from all over. It was uh, it was a fascinating time. We did a lot of uh, fresh juice. Matter of fact, we started making our own carrot juice 
and we realized we couldn't keep up with the production. Uh, we'd go through it so quickly. So we gave Lenny Friedman uh, our juicer and said, why don't you make carrot juice for us? And that was the beginning of Pyramid Juice Company, which was a fabulous big company here. Uh, he made all kinds of juices, supplied all the restaurants, grocery stores, so on and so forth. But that's how his business started. So we worked that restaurant and finally a uh, a couple years before we sold the business, we bought out the breakfast people and the dinner people, and everybody was under one ownership, which was a lot easier. We could control the waitresses, make better service agreements with people, and do a better job of serving people. So we uh, consolidated that, ended up with uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner six days a week with about 55 employees. Was it still the Lithia Grocery? It was still Lithia Grocery. We never changed the name. Uh, just, I don't know, for sentimental reasons, I guess, we never wanted to change the name, so we left it Lithia Grocery. Um, in 79, I sold the business to Tom Manahan and it became Tommy's. And I've actually sold that business six times, so I made more money selling the business than I ever did in running the restaurant. But it was a fabulous experience to be in that restaurant and get to know people. And uh, people are very vulnerable when they're hungry. So it was nice to work with them and take care of them. And, and we were very popular. That was about the time that um, Geppetto's was opening and Brothers was opening and more restaurants were coming in. And by 1979, Lance and I had really, it's hard work running a restaurant. We wanted to sell and we did sell it to Tommy. Uh, what else can I tell you? There's so what many stories. Like? What did Lance do? Lance, um, well, he was my uh, fry cook. He did a lot of the cooking. He did a lot of the wood shopping with his fraternity brothers. Um, Jim Sims worked with us while he was getting his law degree. And uh, Terry Oftedal, who's now an author who comes through Ashland every once in a while, worked with us. And uh, we had another man named Zabriel who helped us with our produce and uh, we were a pretty happy bunch of people. There wasn't much to do in Ashland. We were usually closed on Monday, and in the evenings we would go to our little rental house and maybe do yoga. We didn't have a television, and there were, weren't the activities going on in town that, that we have now. Uh, the college was a college then, and it slowly progressed from Southern Oregon College to Southern Oregon State College, and then to SOU, the university. So that changed. And the city and the Chamber of Commerce started doing more things. Shakespeare was expanding, building up their shoulder seasons. Um, finally, um, one of the projects, Lance and I uh, did a lot of thinking about the city. He was the head of the planning department for many years. And uh, so he was involved in politics. Lance was pretty much a genius ahead of his time. Uh, crazy and wild guy, but uh, very intelligent. And so he did a lot with planning. One of our big problems on the plaza at that time was the alley behind the plaza. Yeah, every business had its own trash can. And if you were in a restaurant business, you had oil and food smells. There were a lot of uh, feral cats living back there, a lot of rats from the creek. And it was, you know, we had to scrub the, the alley behind our restaurant every week to get the grease and everything done. So Lance and I kind of studied the trash situation. We took a couple trips to Europe while we were doing the restaurant to see my family who was there. And we would go into all these little European towns to see how those people handled their trash because it was a real problem here. And uh, so we noticed that uh, the best places had a central area for trash and not everybody having their own trash containers. So um, that's one thing we learned in Europe 
Uh, the other thing, well, I'm going to get into the other thing later because that involves another building. But so we came back after that trip to Europe and we talked to the city about putting in a central trash area, which we have now, and all the restaurants and all the businesses take their cardboard and trash there. And you don't have the oil, you don't have the, the food smells. It stays so much cleaner in the back. About that time, Lance was talking to the lady who owned the Oddfellows building. And uh, she and he came to agreement and we were able to purchase that building. The upstairs was condemned, um, but I went up there and I looked at it and there was a beautiful old Chinese wool rug and I lifted it up and there was a virgin oak flooring. And that was where the Odd Fellows had always done their meetings. So I put in a dance studio and that became the Plaza Dance Studio. And uh, we just did everything we could to stay in town because so many people in the late 70s, early 80s, all through the 80s, we're having to leave Ashland and go to the cities to find a job. So we did everything we could um, to stay here. I, um, up, up in the space where the Black Sheep is now in the Odd Fellows building, after we did, well actually before we did a lot of the renovation to the historic building, and, and it wasn't recognized as historic before that, um, I went in there and I, I ran a modeling agency. We had an answering service. Um, I did the dance studio. I mean, you just did anything you could. I did a lot of the fashion shows for Seroptimus for years, advertising the clothes of different shops in town. We did tea room modeling up at the Winchester Inn. And it was so much fun at lunchtime having all these ladies sit there and have the models move around through them, you know. So, yeah, we did a lot of things. Can you talk about how the Ashland Daily Tidings kind of functioned in the community at that time? Well, the Daily Tidings was everything. In those days, the Daily Tidings was a, a real business. I mean, you know, we had, first they were on Main Street where Ashland Homes is, and then they moved out uh, to the southern part of town out by the university in that big building. And uh, the Daily Tidings was very influential. They had local writers, uh, a lot of people contributing to the paper, a lot of letters to the editor from controversial characters in town, and there were a lot of them, always have been, probably always will be. But um, the Daily Tidings was a big part of, of Ashland, and it's been slowly but surely, you know, Changed. changed, yeah, as the newspaper business has changed a lot. When did Lance start writing? Lance started writing probably in the mid to late 80s. And uh, it, it surprised me because he had never been a writer before. But he, he was very involved in politics. He got to know a lot of people. He heard a lot of the stories that were going on in town, and he loved the history, so he did a lot of historic writing. Uh, he was a very funny guy, that's why I married him, he made me laugh. And uh, so he also liked writing humor pieces, so. And uh, great imagination, um, much more out there than I was. I was kind of like the everyday person doing the work, but he was coming up with all the fantasies, and and the stories of the raccoons playing, playing poker in our backyard and uh, you know, all the different little tangents he got off on. So um, he became, he, he started writing in the late 80s and all through the 90s. And did he write in the Daily Tidings? Yes, he wrote, he wrote um, a lot for the Tidings, doing historic pieces and uh, he wrote for some travel magazines. A matter of fact, he wrote about uh, Ashland's big Halloween uh, that we used to do at night, not the children's parade. This was for adults in the evening and closed off the main street. And um, he publicized that in the travel magazines. And uh, a lot of people came to town for that. But the last year, the police were in costume instead of in uniforms and a bunch of uh, wild and crazy guys from Klamath, I think, came over with their baseball bats and guns 
and it got a little out of hand so the city said no more and they didn't allow the street to be closed off anymore yeah. and now it's transitioned into the children's parade and more children and adults during the day than in the evening can you like talk about be. drugs over that period of time cannabis. drugs well you know cannabis uh, we were all hippies and yeah, we were smoking pot in a hidden way you know we'd climb under the bridge uh, on the creek and smoke down there and uh, the communes, of course, had, had pot, some pot growing, um, but it was pretty low-key. I mean, uh, we weren't doing heavy drugs, it was mostly pot. It was really quite an innocent time, very innocent time when you hear about what's going on now. I do remember uh, one winter that we found out that a homeless man had passed away in the back off the alley, there was a bridge going up to, to uh, Granite Street, and they had found his body in there, and he had died of heroin. And that was kind of shocking to me. Um, this was probably the late 70s. It, you know, I wasn't used to that. We were really kind of in la-la land uh, in our perfect little world, and uh, the homeless population was not as large as it is now. We weren't used to hearing about heroin, and that just didn't touch us. Um, the war was going on this whole time. The whole Vietnam War or was how going is that on. Impacting the community and the culture. Well, you know, as I as I watch history now from those days, I realize that I was kind of in a dreamy little land. I we were very unaffected here. I mean, we did our thing and we had a beautiful life and I don't think that we were as conscious. I didn't read the newspaper, didn't watch the news on TV. We just went day to day cooking, cleaning, you know, living our lives here and I don't think that we really thought about it that much. Lance, of course, had gotten out of the draft by then. The draft was over. Um, We knew what was going on in the world around us, but we weren't as conscious. It wasn't 24-hour news like it is now. And uh, we, we weren't connected to it. Mm -hmm. We were in our little idyllic place doing our work, working hard. Um, I, I met a man uh, in Portland who came to our restaurant, who came to Lithia Grocery. He was going to the university, or to Sauk at that time. And uh, he was one of our customers. I didn't know anything about him, but I met him 30 years later and he, he laughed. He says, I remember you from the restaurant. And I was surprised that hippies were working so hard and making money. But of course, we were very well educated, uh, business trained people. We weren't just, you know, people living on a commune. We were actually, we came from a bunch of training to this point. So he was surprised to see that some hippies could pull that off because we were dressing that way in the restaurant, you know. Um, we'd wear our uh, bikinis and go and lay in the creek and then put our skirt on and come back to work because we didn't have air conditioning in those days. So that's how we would work, you know, and uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. But the country was definitely changing. The Vietnam vets were coming back to the country and not being appreciated, and there was just a lot of problems. I mean, you know, the politics of the time, and so we just kind of turned it off. We didn't think about it that much. Yeah. So time went on, and different businesses came on the plaza and it just got better and better and better. I became a real estate agent in 1979. Uh, interest rates were about 20% then and one of our banks in town had just gone out of business, had gone bankrupt or something. They closed the doors. They called all their loans and they had made most of the local loans for people and so everybody had to rewrite their loans at 20%. They just called all the loans, and uh, that's when I got into real estate. It was boot camp. We didn't sell anything for years. It was it was tough. So that's when I was still doing uh, fashion shows, doing all kinds of little things so I could keep going. 
stay here and not have to move to San Diego or LA or Portland to get a job. It was really important to us that we stay here. We had bought a house in the railroad district in the mid 70s for $12,000. And you didn't tell people you lived below the boulevard in those days. And it was mostly older homes above the boulevard. Some newer, but not like now. I mean, we've gone up into the forest interchange now and a lot of big homes up there, big views. It was more in the 90s and 2000 that people started flocking here from California. A lot of retired people with money build the big homes, you know, the McMansions all through the hills. It wasn't like that. The railroad district was in real bad shape. The state came through and gave the owners of property there money to insulate and put foundations under the homes. So the railroad district started building up and it still was the bad part of town. We had 20 trains a day and there was a turntable at the end of 8th Street. My home's on the corner of 8th and B. I still live in the same home 45 years later. Um, it, it's changed quite a bit. Now it's kind of the groovy place to be, although I see another change now. I see so many changes. I, I've always sold a lot of businesses. Most realtors don't sell businesses because I sold my own business. I am a business person, so I take on that challenge. And it used to be that somebody would buy a business on the plaza just to get a place on the plaza. But now downtown is spread all the way up to the library. And you see a lot of vacancies now. So people don't have to buy a business on the plaza to get a, a location. So that's changed it. Amazon and the online ordering has changed the retail business completely. Although Ashland is still special because we have boutique-like shops and people want to come here to spend time and buy things. So it's a little bit different but still it's affecting retail a lot. So I see a real difference in the, the business uh, environment downtown Ashland. And I'm hoping that we won't end up with a lot of franchises in our retail spaces because that'll make us like everybody else if we have a lot of um, things that are everywhere else in the world. So I see that difference. And then the housing now the railroad district's all built up. Everybody likes to be able to walk to town. But I'm seeing a change in the demands of a buyer. They don't want old houses anymore. They want the new houses with all the bells and whistles. And uh, so Ashland's trying to keep up with the building. We've got several newer developments that have come up. And uh, selling the old house is a lot more difficult than it used to be. Um, I'd say in the 80s, 90s, you saw a lot of people coming here uh, working on the older homes, getting them on the historic register. When we did the Odd Fellows building and put it on the historic register, there were tax credits for doing that. Uh, some of the homes, people got tax credits for fixing them up. Uh, it was really important to people about the history of things. I see, I see that kind of slipping away. I don't see people spending as much time or having as much interest in the historic aspects. They're all for the new, quick and easy, consume, consume, consume. Uh -huh. It's a very different time. I feel there's a loss. Um, and it might be the influence of people coming from big towns where they don't pay attention to the history of the location. Uh, the town's gotten very big. Uh, we still have a historic commission, but they really don't have many teeth. You know, all, all they can do is protect a facade of a house. But I don't see a lot of people taking that, those projects on like we did in the 80s. Yeah. A lot of people came here and they just loved having an old home and bringing it back and we would have historic tours. You know, if you're on the historic commission, you have to have your house open one day a year for the public to come through. And it was a big occasion here when we do that. And you don't hear about that so much anymore. Can you, um, can you talk about any scandals or? Scandals? I mean, <laughs> Well, um, interesting stories, maybe. 
Oh, there's a lot of stories in the Naked City. Let me see which one I can think of. I may have to get back to you on it and write some notes for you because I, I, there's so many of them. Um, Why did you call it the Naked City? Well, there's just so many stories here and there's so many bones buried in this, you know, town and the family dramas and the scandals, I mean, you know. The man who wanted to develop Ashland Creek Drive, who had the lawsuit against everybody in town, all the city councilors, everybody, and he fought. He, he, I think it was a German man. I can't remember his name, but that's something worth looking up. There's a big to-do about developing up into the hills that was not going to be allowed, and now we've got mansions going all the way up to the top there. You know, it's just like oh, there's so many big things. Um, couple realtors got killed in Medford and uh, that affected all the real estate agents. Right now, a matter of fact, they've got a new safety app that they're trying to get everybody to use because real estate agents are sitting ducks, you know. So that was a big thing that shook the whole valley. Uh, the two little girls who were killed in Ashland. Um, at that time, Lance and I were working on the armory and uh, we had the car wash there and the grocery store and uh, in the car wash they found the blanket that had wrapped up the little girl who was killed and they found the guy who did it as a waiter in a restaurant right by the university that was a biggie things like that they come through of course in Ashland everything's a big deal um, I don't know, you just think about little things that have just happened lately, like the Senior Center and the recall and all these things. Everything's always a big deal here. And there's so many watchdogs, people who have come from other bigger cities who have seen them disappear that are here now watching everything, you know, and trying to protect it. I don't know, it may be out of hand. I don't know if they can ever get control of everything now, but it's always been a controversial place. And the people who come here are always a little different. And uh, they're well-traveled, well-educated in general. And uh, it makes for a very vibrant and interesting town. Now, you didn't talk about the armory before. Well, the armory was an I interesting issue. Lance and I just loved taking on these big projects. We did uh, uh, the Orth building in Jacksonville. We redid that building. And then we, uh, we saw that the armory was coming up for sale because the army wanted to build the new armory that's out on East Main Street. So we went up to Salem and we talked to the army and we had a partner, Tim Cusick. Tim and Suzanne Cusick were our partners on the building. And we went up and met all the Army guys, and I, I, I'm not sure, but I think we bought the Armory for 325000 And now what are we going to do with it, you know? What are we going to do? So we decided we'd make it into a venue and use it for different concerts, things like that, and we started trying to develop the downstairs, worked on all the offices, got the offices rented out. And uh, Lance, who was a political creature, he and Tim um, went to the state and they were able to get a $500,000 grant that we would match if everybody approved of it. And. Uh, Meanwhile, we had converted the car wash into four little shops. You know where they are now, the flower shop, uh, good old et cetera, baking, that was the car wash. And uh, so we were trying all kinds of things to get things going, and here this $500,000 grant would have really helped us. But we felt that the powers to be in town were threatened by having another venue that they did not control. And it turned out to be true. Gordon Medeiros at that time was the mayor of Ashland. He was on the board of directors for the Shakespearean Theater. And uh, he wrote a letter to Salem saying, 
we don't think these people need the money. We don't need that kind of investment in another venue in Ashland. So we lost out on that. And actually, the Armory Project was the albatross that took us down. We had to go into bankruptcy. We lost everything because of the Armory and because of that vote. So that was kind of disappointing, and it's still a little bit difficult for me to go in there when I see that Shakespeare uses that building, when they do the Martin Luther King thing there, when they have all kinds of parties and everything, and of course the DeBoers own it, and uh, money is no issue to them. The other thing that the Army didn't tell us when we bought the building was that the huge beams in the Armory were failing. And that took all the money we had up front to fix that. So that's why we were in such desperate straits with that building. Wow. So it was a great project. I felt like we did a real benefit. Um, the grocery store had been Ray's Market and Ray's sold the market and we put in Cantwell's. And Cantwell's was a great natural restaurant. They overextended themselves and went to Medford and they lost everything too. So it was a time of real risk taking. risk taking, and that risk definitely took us down. So it must have been a period where the economy was sort of inching back. And yeah, and we jumped ahead. We were always a little bit ahead of the curve, and that's always dangerous when you're doing things like that. So that was the lesson we learned on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, Florence, Florence and Bill Schneider were incredible people. I met her through AAUW. Um, I've been a member of AAUW since I graduated at UCLA in 1970. And I came here and became a member right away. And Florence was kind of, every, uh, she was a mentor to young women who were go-getters. And I was one of them. And. Uh, she was an incredible woman. She was, she had great stories. You know, she knew Eleanor Roosevelt, and she would talk to us about her and her life in those days. And um, she would just train us to become the president or vice president or secretary of AAUW. And and she was always such a joyful person, such an up person, such a smart woman, uh, very well educated. We had a book club. Uh, and we would often meet at Florence's house. And she was just quite a woman, quite a woman. And uh, an old fashioned woman and yet very progressive. She's very involved in the university. Very much so. Um, Maybe town and gown relations would be an interesting idea. Yeah, um, you know, at that time they were building the art gallery at the university and uh, she talked to us a lot about that, about the architect that they had chosen, Will, somebody, I can't remember, and he died in an airplane crash as soon as the building was built. And uh, she mourned his loss. Uh, but that was one of the things. She also uh, did the uh, senior residence at the end of Maple Street there. They, de they uh, donated that land to the hospital, maybe. I can't remember who they donated the land to, but she she built that senior residence, and she was actually in there at the end of her life. Uh, she stayed there herself. And she was, I think of her often, beautiful white hair and a French twist and bright sweaters and just such, such an incredible woman, such an incredible person. And she and her husband had run the school for children in Arizona. And uh, so she, she was always thinking about education and uh, helping people, women especially. She was, she was very much of a feminist. Yeah, she, she, was, she was a very neat lady. I miss her a lot. And uh, yeah, she and her husband were, were very big parts of Ashland, probably in the 90s. I think that's about their, their heyday here. They had a home um, over near Green Meadows and they had an indoor swimming pool and they would get their exercise there swimming every day and you know. Uh, Lance and I went with um, the Raiders and the um, 
athletic club, the, the supporters of the team, to Japan. And it was kind of an interesting time because it was when Southern Oregon State College, that's what it was at that time. And, uh, but they were all on the trip. So we, we got to know them on a real social, personal basis. And uh, that's right when the, the school was gonna become a university and join the state system. And that was a big change. It was a big change for indirectly for the town and directly for the, the, the college. But these people who made those changes, there were Reno, Steve Reno was the president. And then the other guy, oh, I can see him and his wife perf perfectly, was the one who went back up to Portland or wherever the head school is. But he, and he became the head of the whole state system. These were the people who made those changes, and I and I knew them personally, and it was it was really neat to see that happen, because yeah. the university became much more powerful, I think. Did the students come to town? The students come to town, uh, definitely. There's um, it, there's more interchange between the students in town now than I think there used to be. Well, there's more of them for one thing. I don't know if they still have the American Language Academy on campus. No. They don't. And that was such a powerful thing in the um, 80s and 90s because we had a lot of exchange students from Japan, from Asia, from South America. Mexico, of course, has always been a big uh, partner. And we did go down to Guanajuato and see the university and visit with all those people. <coughs> so that was really neat. But, um, yeah, I think the university plays a bigger part in, in Ashland than it used to. Shakespeare? Well, they do an incredible job. It's been kind of an interesting uh, transition because when I first came, I was a Seroptimist for 20 years, you know, and we did the pillow booth there. And uh, that's when uh, the green show was the little Shakespearean dancers, you know, in the little costumes. And um, the theater had not been enclosed yet. And all the Seroptimists were worried because we thought they were going to completely enclose the place. And then they wouldn't have needed our pillows and blankets. So that was, you know, a big deal for us. Um, Lance once wrote a story about Willy World, how Ashland is just a company town that survives by their, their good w will, you know. And I, I see that to a certain extent. Um, I don't know, it might, it might still be my old hippie ways of thinking about big establishments taking too much power, but um, they're very good neighbors. They do an incredible job. They bring a lot of people to town. I love going to the theater. I'm, I'm thrilled about it. Uh, in my restaurant at Lithia Grocery, we had uh, charge accounts for all the actors and all the tech people. And of course, we sold uh, bagels and cream cheese for 35 cents. We lost money on every one of those things. But we had a lot of people come in, and, and the actors always paid their bills. There, I, we never got stuck with any, any bills from any of the actors. And in those days, it, it just seemed like they were more downtown. It was such a small community that you really got to know the actors and all the people working at Shakespeare. Now it's kind of like a monster business. You know, there's so many people working there and, and the actors, you still see them in the restaurants and things, but it's not as close and as friendly as it used to be. People, when I was doing my restaurant, that are still coming back every year and they come in to visit me at the real estate office. And uh, a lot of people don't like the gender fluidity, um, the racial fluidity, uh, a lot of the new stuff that's been brought in through the last couple different artistic directors. But I realize that the theater has to be progressive to attract the younger population. So a lot of the older people are just going to grumble and not get used to the change or else they will get used to the change and appreciate it, you know. But oh yeah, there's there's been a lot of grumbling. Well, they say 45% of this town is seniors, yeah. people over 55. Well, they brought a lot of money with them. 
There's a very, uh, well, I think it's all over America, though, the top 1%, you know, the classes, you know, upper class and then the lower class, the, the poorer people, the homeless people. How can people come into town and buy a house for a million, two million? But it's happening all over the country. It's really separating us instead of bringing us closer together. Yeah. yeah. Change. Yeah, change. I, I don't, I don't know how long this change can keep going on. For, I mean, these many people are rich and all these people are poor. I mean, how, how long does that happen? I mean, the French Revolution happened, you know. I wonder how it's going to straighten itself out, or if it ever will. Well, I, I don't know. To see it. I don't know. But um, it's all over now, you know. It's so many people. It's hard to go back to a place and see it changed. Here, I've I've been here all along as the change happened, so kind of, you know, you don't notice it as much. But I went back to the Philippines about five years ago with my brother, and I loved that place when I was growing up. And I was so shocked at the violence and the number of people, just the population. And I couldn't recognize anything in the whole town where I'd lived for eight years, you know. Uh, so in Ashland, I, I, I don't focus on the change as much, but it's changed a lot. Well, there is a, a protective quality about Ashland. You know, people have always come here to be healed. The Nez Perce Indians used to come out to where the lake is for their festivals for healing. Uh, people came here at the turn of the century for the waters. And uh, when I first moved here in the 70s, there were several Indian women that would come down to town and they were healers. Um, the Jessel Healing, Cancer Healing Camp, you know. There, there's a whole feeling of healing here. And there's also a feeling of being protected here. I've always felt it. I know we're surrounded by volcanoes and stuff, but I've always felt safe here. Um, and it just, uh, the other thing is a lot of people want to be here and they can't come here for some reason or not. Some people just cannot make it here. And it's almost like I feel like they don't belong here, and so they, they have to move on. It used to be people couldn't come here because there weren't any jobs. Now we've got a lot more jobs, the medical field, the university, the city itself. Uh, there's a lot more jobs here now, but still people who don't have that same feeling don't seem to survive here for very long. I see people who come and buy a house, and they're gone in a year. They can't make it here. They don't like it here. This is something's not right. And I just don't think they belong here. I've seen it for years. I don't know what it is. It's a protective layer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I couldn't live anywhere else. I, I grew up all over the world and came back to the States to go to UCLA. And Ashland's always been a little part of Argentina where I went to high school and the Philippines and Belgium where my mother was from and it's all right here and it's still all right here. It's changed a lot. I've had to really be at peace with change and allow things to go. Near my house used to be all apple orchards. Now it's all condos, you know. Uh, they're packing us in tightly because they don't want to, well they can't really expand Ashland too much. So letting go of my fear of change has been a biggie, but I've kind of pulled away from politics because I don't agree with some of the stuff that goes on here. And I just do my business and work in my garden and walk my dog. Yeah, fun to talk about it. It is fun. Yeah. It is fun. Yeah.